Lots of people joining. My balcony before my neighbor called the cops. Right. We're going to start at 3.05 Eastern. Thanks everyone for coming in early. We have a few more minutes. Folks, a couple of minutes. I believe we're almost at the end of day three. This has gone very quickly. Okay, start in one minute. We are going to start right on time. With a dynamic presentation today. Thanks for introducing yourself in the chat. I would love to know who is here. I feel that whoever that was, kind of like what I've been taught in yoga of a, of a lion's breath to just let it out. I'll share one quick anecdote and then we can get started. My daughter is five and I think she was taught something similar in school. She came home and she was making this noise that kind of sounded like that. I said, what, what's going on? She said, oh, well, I was feeling angry. And then she made that noise. She's like, but now I'm not angry. I got the angry out. Great. Fantastic. Um, all right. Well, I have 3.05 um, Eastern time. So I'm going to get us started. Uh, folks can continue, of course, coming in as I do our, our quick little introduction. Uh, so hi, everybody. Welcome to the Center of Excellence for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultations conference equity from the start my name is lauren and i will serve as your session moderator i am joined by cynthia who will serve as our technical host uh, the session is being recorded uh, transcription is available through the zoom platform and if you have any questions please feel free to uh, to use the chat feature to get in touch with us um, we may or may not actually have much time for q a at the end these sessions as you all know are very short um, and if that is the case then our presenters have uh, graciously come up with a couple ways to get in touch if you'd like to get in touch with them um, they'll give you email you can also do a direct 
message through the attendee hub. Um, so we will kind of see how quickly we, we get through information, but just wanted to let everyone know that information. Um, and so I am delighted to pass this off to our presenters today, and I'm going to pass the ball over to Rosario. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome everybody to our presentation. I am going to uh, share my screen. Okay, so here we go. So I want to welcome you all to our presentation. My name is Rosario Williams. Oh, sorry, I'm already messing up. <laughs> my name is Rosario Williams and I am the Family Wellbeing Manager at Child Care Resource Center. Child Care Resource Center or better known as CCRC is a, is a resource and referral agency located in Southern California. Uh, we are located in four different communities in the San Fernando Valley, Anilo Valley, Victorville, and San Bernardino. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with that area, uh, several of us, actually three out of the four uh, of, of us presenting, uh, we are in the Anilo Valley, which is about which is about 80 miles away from downtown LA uh, in the high desert. And so our area is quite remote, um, and it is rural. It's a, it, it's not, there isn't a lot of transportation out here. So getting to services is difficult. So that is one part of the equity piece here um, for our program. So I want to start by highlighting that, you know, um, there are three unique aspects of our, our ISCMHC program. Um, the first one is that I want to acknowledge, you know, our vulnerability, especially mine, in terms of uh, coming into this space where I've been hearing for the last three days about everyone's experience and all the work that they're doing in, in terms of equity in IACMHC and how new I am in, in this field. So I've been a clinician since 2009, but equity isn't something that was necessarily part of my work as a clinician. And I recently, in the past year, um, became the manager of an IACMHC program and was tasked with designing and implementing and all of that during you know, the pandemic. And so I am quite uncomfortable with um, the term equity because I still am figuring out what that means. And I guess that's why we're all here. So that's one of the, one of the first um, highlights. The second highlight is that we launched a program during a pandemic, which magnified some inequities, but also gave us the opportunity to, you know, to do more and to ask the questions that we really don't have answers to. Uh, such as, you know, how do I hire staff remotely? How do I onboard them remotely? How do I reach out to uh, EC uh, staff to enroll in our program when we're not going face to face? And so that was one of the uh, questions and challenges. And then lastly, again, the, the centering equity in a new program and learning what that was or what that is has been uh, extremely difficult, at least, you know, personally speaking for myself. And as a leader of the program, I'm the program manager for, for uh, the IACMHC program, you know, how do I continue these conversations with, with my team? So those are the highlights that I wanted to start off. And so for our presentation, we're going to try and sprinkle issues of equity throughout. And, you know, this is just a reminder, we all have been already in a lot of presentations over the last three, three uh, days, um, but keeping in mind that, you know, there is no such thing as a safe space, so we're just going to brave into it, and, you know, I, I'm going to imagine what it would be like to be across from you in a room, uh, because I, I can't see faces, I can only see myself, and so, but here are some ideas for how we can continue uh, to create that, that brave space. And so at this time, um, I would like to introduce you to my colleagues who are going to facilitate uh, this presentation with me. So as I previously mentioned, I am Rosario Williams, Family Wellbeing Manager. My pronouns are she, her. I am a married Latinx heterosexual cisgender female. I'm a clinician by training and have provided mental health services to children birth to five for the past 14 years. I now lead the trauma-informed care consultation team and the BEAS program, which we will tell you, which you can see what that is. Um, building early education strategies. And, you know, my uh, journey of equity actually started, I think, re very, very recently. Uh, just to highlight a little bit more about me, um, I grew up in South Los Angeles, which is a, a poverty, an area of poverty. And I went primarily to a high school that was quite segregated. Um, it was only about a couple of blocks away from USC, but all the kids in my school were either. Uh, 
Latinx or Black. And so the first time I sat with a person that looked different was when I went to Cal State Northridge as an undergraduate student. And so for me, it was a, a culture shock. It, I, I really didn't know what to make of it. I kept calling everybody white and they kept telling me, no, I'm Armenian, <laughs> I'm not here to identify. And so I, I, I've continued to learn about that. And so I've learned recently that um, uh, cultural identity is definitely a, uh, just a developmental process. And so I'm learning more about what that is in the context of my work uh, as a leader, as a, as a clinician, and you know, in managing this program. So now I'm going to hand it off to uh, Denise. Thank you, Rosario. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am really excited to be here presenting at my first conference ever. Um, my name is Denise Torres. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I am a married heterosexual Latinx cisgender female. I have two daughters, ages four and 14, three dogs, two Shih Tzus and one Chihuahua. I am bilingual in speaking and writing in fluent Spanish. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and a mental health consult consultant at CCRC, which stands for Child Care Resource Center. A um, little bit about me, I worked in uh, community mental health for six years as a mental health clinician. One of the inequities that I experienced um, was receiving only Spanish speaking clients there uh, due to my being a bilingual clinician. So because of this, I didn't experience the ability to practice my therapeutic language um, in English as much or therapeutic services in English as much um, in comparison to my English speaking colleagues. And with that, I'll hand it over to Grace. Thank you, Denise. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Grace Gaines, Family Wellbeing Mental Health Consultant. My pronouns are she and her. I am married, Latinx, heterosexual, cisgender female. I am an associate marriage and family therapist. I have recently onboarded with CCRC as a mental health consultant. I have worked in different settings, such as an all-boy residential facility and community mental health agency focusing on foster children and foster families. The topic that we'll be discussing is not just la launching a new program during a pandemic, but also discussing inequities and limitations. So that hits close to home for me personally. I was born in South America, Bolivia. So being a minority in this country, I have per personally experienced many limitations and inequities while in school, such as of lack of resources, lack of support and language. And those are just a few. I hope this brings awareness to everyone listening to this conference so we can make the appropriate changes and providing services. So now I will hand it off to Marche. Thank you, Grace. Hello, everyone. My name is Marche Lynch, and I'm also a Bees Mental Health Consultant with CCRC. Um, my preferred pronouns are she, her, and I identify as an African American, heterosexual, cisgender female. I'm a new clinician in training, associate um, clinical, clinical social worker, um, working towards licensure, and I have been working with children of all ages for about four years now. Um, personally, I first learned about equity working um, as a staff member with Palmdale School District, but was not doing hands-on work as like back then. It was not, it was simply only an idea um, in my workplace and not many safe spaces were available um, to have further conversation about you know, the opportunities that children are missing due to their skin color. Um, with that being said, I look forward to always learning more and growing in my role as a mental health consultant. Back to you, Rosario. Thank you, Marche. So to kick off this presentation, I think I need this more to just take a breath because I'm a little nervous, I'm gonna admit. Uh, so we're gonna start with a couple of mindful minutes uh, we often hear about the important role that a calm and responsive adult and secure adult child relationship plays in helping young children learn and grow. So we know that these relationships develop through attuned and sensitive care and, inter and interactions. So in this moment, we're going to put this that intention forward and I invite you to uh, participate in this uh, mindful exercise. So the first step here is that we're going to tune in by placing one hand over your heart to recognize your emotional state and tap into quality the quality of your presence. This is a gesture of self-care and self-compassion. You're invited to close your eyes or adopt a soft gaze. Notice what you're feeling right now and ask yourself, 
What am I feeling and what do I need? Pause to connect to the feelings and needs arising in this moment. So now we're going to reach out with both hands extended, palms facing out and up. This is a gesture of receptivity to the people around you. This is an opportunity to become aware of the feelings and needs of others. With soft eyes looking outward to the people in your circle, ask yourself, what might others be feeling? What do others need? What perspectives do they bring to this experience? Pause and become aware of the feelings, needs, and perspectives of others arising in this moment. So now we're going to connect your two hands together, interlocking them and bringing them into your chest just below your ribs. This is a gesture for successful connection. Take this opportunity to feel confident that you have the resources you need to take care for yourself. With eyes soft or eyes closed, feel confident that you have resources to offer to the people around you now and in the future. You can deepen and strengthen your connection to yourself and others. Pause and notice the sensations, feelings, and thoughts emerging through this practice. So thank you all for participating. Uh, when you're ready, come back um, to the group. And so moving forward with the presentation here, just a few takeaways uh, for today. We want you to connect with us um, a little more. So even if we don't have questions or we don't get to the end, I'm gonna try not to fight the urge to try to get through all the slides. Um, there is our contact information for you to reach out more. And it's not about me as the expert. I actually wanna learn from you and what you're doing in your programs. So we're going to talk about three things today, just equity considerations in the IEC MHC program design and launch, learning about the successes and challenges that we had in launching a program during the pandemic, and then some of the, sharing some adaptations that we made to the program delivery and access. Okay, so here I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the equity considerations in IEC MHC. One of the points that I wanna mention here, a side note, is that I we're realizing, or I'm realizing how important language is. And one of the things that I'm trying to get better at is at, I guess, using language that's a lot more inclusive. And so when I started at CCRC three years ago, I kept calling everybody, everybody a provider, just a provider. And that would include center-based family, childcare centers, uh, relative exempt, everybody was a provider. And so now we're using the term early childhood educator. And sometimes I still get stuck and go back to providers. So just for the sake of these presentation, if I use those terms, I use them interchangeably uh, because sometimes I still forget, you know, that I'm trying to be a lot more inclusive. And so um, a unique aspect here about CCRC is that we have an in-house research department that helps us with informing our ideas and evaluating them to see how they're working. And so I do want to acknowledge that that is a privilege to have a, our own uh, research department that just conducts research for us and informs what we're gonna do. And so in 2021, when we came up with the idea of an IEC MHC program, we conducted five focus groups with a total of 26 participants to inform the process of designing the program. And input was gathered from, the C from CCRC's trauma-informed care consultants who were already working with providers since 2018. And then we gathered also information from early childhood educators um, in Northern, Los Angeles County and San Bernardino counties. And these providers included family child care providers, or we refer as FCCs, center directors and center staff, and then also licensed exempt providers, for example, family, friends, and neighbors, who we refer to as uh, FFNs. So 
So after talking to the trauma-informed care consultants, or I call them TAC consultants for short, uh, they identified several of these three things uh, that, uh, and there was more that was found, but these are the ones that I pulled out for these, this particular uh, presentation, um, that they found that in the pandemic, uh, the providers reported that they didn't really receive, or they, they, they found a disparity in the support that they received. A lot of it was targeted for the children uh, who were exhibiting um, behaviors, uh, but not necessarily for, for them. So there was not as much support on, for them in terms of the, the stressors that they were finding. Some of the stressors that they had were surrounding health and safety, as I think we, were, we all were, but how to keep their, their places safe uh, to prevent outbreaks. And then also the economic insecurity. The economic insecurity came more from uh, the uh, family, you know, the FCCs, the family child care providers, who are not part of like a large organization, child care organization. So they were fearful that you know they they were have to close their centers because there was no uh, revenue coming in for them. So that that was one of the concerns that they had. Um, the other was that they needed more resources and how to uh, support parents. Um, in, in working more with them in a collaborative approach. So for us, you know, for this particular program, we wanted to make sure that our system was in place to provide that, to have more active conversations with the early childhood uh, education staff about how to co collaborate with families more um, in a way that doesn't, maybe they, they were perceived as having more power than the parents or it created that a power differential. And then lastly, um, they wanted, a, the, the trauma forking consultants felt that the program had to allow for more relationship building between the consultant and the consultee. So that was another important thing when we were thinking about how many uh, consultation visits should we offer? Uh, how many should there be? What's, what number is that? Is there like a magical number or is it the way of being of the way that we were with the provider? So that was something that we had to uh, consider. And then for the, the considerations for early childhood educators, they also shared some things here with us. And one of the biggest things too was that they, they have noticed in their work and a lot of them have a lot of experience, like more than 10. So it's not like they, you know, it's something that they've seen uh, throughout their time as uh, providing services is that there was, there's a disparity in families accessing the, the resources that they need more along the lines of mental health, uh, referring them or connecting them to mental health services, and then also uh, for developmental screening, such as maybe a regional center, for example. They also uh, found that they also struggle with uh, collaborating more with caregivers, and they wanted the program, this IACMHC program, to be flexible, to be accessible in the hours that they could uh, access the program, they also valued the relationship between themselves and the, and the uh, mental health consultants. And they also wanted a consultant that was knowledge, knowledgeable in all the, the, e, the EC types of settings. And so for me as the leader of the program, it was important for me to infuse the, the onboarding with uh, information. And so Georgetown um, Center of Excellence website has tons of resources. And so everyone that onboards as a mental health consultant has to complete the foundational mo modules, the introduction to the best practice tutorials, the equity chats and the equity webinar series. And they also have to complete the center of excellence assessments. And in addition to that, one of the things that I do is I lead, um, I don't know what we, we, I don't think they have a, a name, but I just keep calling them racial equity groups or equity chats. And we, I just take both of my teams, the trauma-informed care consultants and the mental health consultants uh, providing services. And we talk about equity and we talk about race and racial healing and keep the conversation going. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Marche. Thank you, Rosario. So information from the focus groups um, provided us with additional considerations, such as pros and cons of all IECMHC um, from the early childhood educators' perspectives. So in which they pretty much describe structural aspects of the IECMHC program, um, perceived benefits and intrinsic factors that would motivate them to use the program, um, for instance. They want the consultant to work with the ECE schedule um, they want the same consultant um, to be assigned to their program and not a new one each time. Um, they want minimal paperwork burden, as you know, all of us do. <laughs> um, you know, they want the program to be free of cost. 
Um, the program is available to all children, not just those served by a CCRC program. Um, the program is available for children of all ages. Um, early childhood educators um, receive a stipend for using the program. Um, mental health consultants provide trainings and resources to ECE staff. And lastly, the child's best interests at heart with ECE staff willing to do anything um, to support the children. Next, the ECE staff also provided us with um, considerations about the consultant or characteristics that a consultant should possess. Um, they, sh they shared that they want the consultant to be, of course, someone that they can trust. You know, it's important to build rapport and relationship in such short time. As we all know, you know, first impressions are everything. Um, they want, you know, just be willing to meet with the caregivers of the children with whom they work with. Um, they want the consultant to have experience with all types of ECE programs and know the environment, um, have the capacity to refer the caregiver to um, resources, work with the ECE staff as a team rather than the expert, and um, be reliable. And you know that includes following up, sending timelines, being responsive um, consistently. Lastly, just being able to provide resources, as stated, tools and strategies to the ECE staff while they wait for consultation um, to observe the child. As mentioned, um, IECMHC services should be accessible um, and expedited. Early childhood educators um, indicated that they would prefer to request um, the service through an online portal or by email. Um, nevertheless, they also reported that there is value in requesting the service by telephone because by telephone, you know, they would be able to describe the urgency of the request and would be able to better describe the situation for which they are requesting um, the support from our program. All right, IECMHC program name matters. So when creating the program, we wanted to ensure that our community, the population that we serve, were included in our program development. Um, therefore, during the focus groups, we included them in creating a name for the program where they were able to provide examples as well as give suggestions and feedback in the process. In this, we needed to um, take avoiding the using the word mental health into consideration because a lot of us, as Rosario stated, you know, come from come from like community mental health backgrounds or residential backgrounds where saying mental health or, you know, just using that word was very normalized. So we had to make it a point to just be more mindful not to use this term due to the stigma that it has within our own community and wanting ECE staff to sign up for services as opposed to stray away from services. All right, with that being said, what exactly is in our program name? For starters, B stands for Building Early, Early Education Strategies. Um, I think it's, an, it's great and empowering to acknowledge that we are a new program, um, less than a year old. And you know, with that, we have had the pleasure and ability to create our program through an equity lens by, as stated, you know, involving our community and creating a name for our program. Um, in order to do that, we needed to narrow um, our list of possible names down to five and have our internal CCRC staff utilize SurveyMonkey to vote on the name that they thought was best um, for our program. In speaking about equity, um, we do follow, as Rosario stated, Georgetown Center of Excellence equity model to utilize equity trainings and foundational trainings um, to educate new staff during the onboarding process and in order to familiarize ourselves with the word equity. You know, personally, I remember that um, when I first started with CCRC, as I am a new staff, um, I had to ask myself, you know, what exactly is equity in mental health consultation and what would it look like in the field? Um, these trainings definitely like helped me broaden my knowledge and allowing me to become more aware of my own biases, um, just learn in my role um, as to what that looks like and become comfortable with having these uncomfortable conversations, both in and outside of my role. So our program offers three types of consultations. 
um, with the first being classroom focused consultation that is only specifically for center based programs where child specific consultation and program focused consultation are for all program um, types to ensure that you know we are including um, FFNs family friends and neighbors and FCCs family child cares. All right, with that being said, now I'm going to hand it over to Denise, who will talk about the success and challenges of our program. Thank you, Marche. Mm -hmm. So launching a new program in and of itself is already an immense task. Now we did that during a pandemic. So with that being said, I'm gonna just discuss some successes and challenges that we encountered uh, while launching a mental health consultation program during COVID. I'm going to go ahead and also include the equity aspects that we encountered along the way. So areas of success. Um, starting the program during the pandemic has been a success in and of itself uh, because it demonstrated that the the ECEs were really interested in the services that we were offering. Just knowing how limited the time ECS have is, and yet they still sell out our services led us to understand that there was an immense need for this program. Um, another area of success uh, has been initial outreach efforts. Um, these yielded requests for services from centers and from family child care providers. So the way that we went about our initial efforts were first working inside out, right? So we were meeting internally with um, other CCRC divisions. We joined their staff meetings or really any meeting they'd allowed us to join. And we developed the BEES open house presentation in which we um, identified what the BEES program was, um, how you can request services and what it looked like. Um, with, while doing all of this, we were always, you know, keeping in mind um, that we were looking into equity and that we were being equitable overall. Um, we went ahead and posted uh, these open houses in the Early Care and Education Workforce First Registry. Um, and here ECEs were able to sign up uh, for the open house and join us via Zoom. Um, and so, like I said, we were just really trying to um, make this open house as available as possible to get the word out there that our program was ready um, to be utilized. We also joined um, service provider area meetings and presented it there. And then we sent text and email blasts through CCRC. Um, again, really just looking into equity and, and having it be out there. Uh, another area of success was um, and looking at it uh, from an equity standpoint, um, that the early childhood educators have access to a beast pro to the beast program in their communities. So that was huge, right? Because as consultants, we wanted to ensure that for one, the service hours that were offered, um, that the ECEs could attend um, and that it was available in the language that they spoke in, right? So. Um, after we provided the services, we got feedback from the ECEs and they reported that they felt supported just by having us be present um, in the ECE meeting. So that was huge. Um, and also ECE leadership communicated that they felt more attuned to what was happening in a particular situation or with a particular child in the classroom or in the ECE setting. So this um, gave us the idea that we are providing them with all with more support, um, the ECEs, the children, and the families. Um, and lastly, um, children have access to the support that they need, right? That developmentally appropriate socialization um, following quarantine and isolation. And that was a big deal, right? Because they were pretty much isolated for almost two years. Um, and we found that simply by having the mental health consultant's presence um, be a constant presence in the ECE setting gave a sense of security and support to the ECE staff. And, you know, just to end the areas of success, overall, we just wanted to make sure that we have the systems in place to provide equitable, equitable services and to provide the appropriate tools to every ECE we provided services to. Moving on to areas of challenge. <laughs> Going into starting this program, we had an idea of what equity was. However, not 
entirely. Um, only providers that had technology were able to access us. Why? Because, because we were not able to contact the ECEs in person because of COVID regulations. So we know that if an early childhood educator would have called us and asked us to do the observations differently, we probably would have explored that. However, we did not actively seek that experience. But this is not a mistake. It's a learning opportunity and a demonstration that we have to work on our knowledge of equity. And that's what we are continuously doing. So we, we're literally building the plane while we are flying it. Um, so of course, flexibility is required uh, to comfortably modify practices and to make them accessible. Uh, from the mental health consultant's perspective, being able to familiarize our, ourselves with the paperwork is really important, knowing what um, the agreements say, consents, assessments, things like that, because we want to be able to present this information equitably, whether or not the ECE has access to electronic means, right? Um, secondly, <laughs> Mental health consultation during virtual times is extremely challenging. Um, this past year, we found that, you know, building rapport in person requires more intention. Um, so warmth and interaction can become compromised when you're working through electronic means. Um, so keeping that in mind when we're working with the ECEs is 100% necessary to maintain that equity. That equity. Um, next, adapting to technology, right? We want to ensure that the ECEs and the caregivers can easily access the platforms that are needed um, for our programs, a Zoom, Adobe a Pro, things like that. Um, some workarounds uh, to these challenges were having a plan B or plan C, um, preparing for technical difficulties, communicating these difficulties clearly and calmly um, at the onset of services, uh, setting reminders to complete tasks that may not have been completed um, due to these technical difficulties, and just really thinking about it equitably, making sure that these childhood educators um, educators familiarize themselves with the technology that we're utilizing, using phone calls, prep time, things like that. Always, always keeping that equity piece in mind, right? Um, are we fully supporting this ECE with the technology support that they need? These are some questions that we ask ourselves. Another challenge, right? Zoom observation challenges. <laughs> So sometimes, and I laugh because I've experienced a lot of fun ones, um, but a full classroom view not available, not being available. So sometimes they use, um, the ECs use iPads or maybe even a phone or a computer camera. And so sometimes we can't see what's going on. Audio sometimes is not reliable. Sometimes you have a child playing with wooden toys in front of the iPad and you really can't hear what's going on. And then there's that out of sight, out of mind, right? Provide to forget that we're observing and um, because we're not physically there. And so really working those things out um, in the onset of the services. And um, next, early childhood educators and ECE leadership's perception of these services, right? So definitely acknowledging the power differentials between the mental health consultant and the ECE is another important equity piece, just very important, right? There's a perceived power that may happen. Um, there's, you know, finding apprehension um, with receiving mental health consultation services, possible biases, stigmas, um, or possible perception of power struggle. So it's important to let them know at onset that we're there as a support and not to take over. And finally, outreach during pandemic has been a huge challenge. It's remote, right? So all we could do is electronic flyers, virtual open houses. There's always, a, a, not always, but at times the difficulty establishing solid connections with the community, restrictions of what meetings are available, like only in the evening because, you know, ECEs are working in the mornings, finding new creative ways um, in which we can let others know about the services and just equity, you know, that's a huge one. So again, we just want to continue to make sure that we have these systems in place. We want to provide these equitable services uh, and the tools to every ECE that we provide services to. And with that, I will hand it over to Grace. Thank you, Denise. 
So I'll be discussing the BEAST process. Uh, so the paperless process, I want to start out by saying that creating a paperless process has tons of uh, inequities and limitations. First off, can an early childhood educator or caregiver enroll in the program if they did not have access, access to technology? Probably not, but we'll make it work. Keep in mind that when we launched the program back in July 2021, we were in the heights of the pandemic. We're still in it, but we were heavily under a lot of regulations. We were not allowed to go into uh, those spaces such as childcare and education sites. If they allowed people in, it was really restricted. Only the parents that were picking up and dropping off the, the children were allowing it. Meaning we were not able to collect paperwork from the early childhood educators or caregivers. In creating a paperless process, we created a system where only those that had technology could access. But we also wanted to validate the suggestions and the considerations that the focus group gave us which was that they want a paperless process. We, what we did here is created a simple electronic request for services that was uh, available in English and Spanish, keeping in mind that most of the community we serve are Spanish speaking and English speaking. We wanted to create a form that met those needs. We also collected signatures from Adobe Pro. So all the documentation, including signatures are available through that platform. Again, the disadvantage here is Adobe Pro is in Spanish. It's not in Spanish. We have to make sure that we, we took the time to guide providers in uh, accessing and learning how to navigate it. For a lot of them, it was their first time. Moving forward, we meet them where they are. Part of being a support, part, be, part of being supportive means that we meet them where they are. It sounds a little cliche coming from a therapist, but we do, we wanna hear, inequities uh, that they see while they uh, receive the services from us. If I say, I would love for you to join our program, but you have to fill out a request form, hmm, maybe they will answer, okay, but I don't have a computer. We're not gonna turn them down. So what do we do? The way that we adapt to this is we just, uh, we just let them know, provide us with their information and we will help you. Uh, so the, 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 the requirement will be fulfilled but then we also meet them where they are by providing any technical assistance and the language that they need. We have consultants that are bilingual for providers that speak only Spanish. Then we also have staff members that speak only English for those that, that only speak English. We wanted to make sure that our team was diverse in that way so that they could provide and give, an, give extra sense of comfort to the early childhood educators and caregivers. So now I will discuss normalizing bloopers. <laughs> I think it's dismantling that perception of what we are, <clears throat> that we are the professionals. So coming from a mental health background, we are the professionals, right? Coming, people come to us because we, cert, we hold a certain expertise. Symptomatically, symptomatically breaking it down by being okay with us having bloopers. Some of us maybe still have or feel uncomfortable with having bloopers. For me, the biggest blooper was when I, I sent a, a form via Adobe Pro to uh, my supervisor, Rosario, and I accidentally locked it. I, uh, uh, my supervisor, uh, Rosario, uh, made me feel comfortable <laughs> by letting me know that it's okay. It happens. I'm calling that bloopers, uh, but I'm really saying those mess ups, errors, or mistakes were opportunities, opportunities to learn about how do we do, how to do things better and how to make it easier for us for, and for the community that we're serving. I think the highlights here is really to acknowledge that we do what we do and to stop the way our perceptions of keeping it professional, that we're always right. Here we are trying to launch a program during an uneasy and unknown times. So now I will hand it off to Marche. Thank you, Grace. All right, so we decided to have a panel-like discussion to give you all the chance to gain insight and learn more about our personal experiences in the short time that we have you here. Um, with that being said, question number one. What would you want the audience to know most about the BEES program? And let's start with Denise. Thank you, Marche. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like the audience to know that the B services are a support. 
Mm -hmm. we're, we're here to enhance the skills that the ECEs already have. And we're here to help support the social and emotional development of the children that they work with. Definitely, thank you. Rosario? Well, I would like everyone to know that our program is very, very new and that we launched in July of 2021. And so we're not even a year in. And <laughs> so for us, that's why this presentation was quite, you know, uh, you know, was an achievement in that we're coming here and sharing about our program, but then also talking about all the spots that we're probably missing, right? And so it is very new, but we're wanting to learn more. We're leaning into the process and learning more about what equity is and what it looks like in our settings. Definitely. Grace? I would like the audience to know that BASE program is a multi-level and uh, system-wide program that collaborates with early childhood educators, community mm -hmm. programs, children and caregivers to promote, prevent, and create uh, uh, adequate interventions for children. Thank you. All right, let's move on to question number two. Please share a B success story from an early childhood educator. And we can start with you, Denise. Thank you, Marche. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm actually going to share verbatim uh, what an ECE provider sent to me via email uh, when I did our 30 day check in. Um, this provider had um, some children, but this, she talked about one particular child, um, but some children with non-compliant behaviors, um, mainly communicated by crying and whining. And what I did during the feedback was I provided just some techniques for her to re redirect the child mm -hmm. and to mainly focus on the positive behaviors that the child was, uh, was engaging in. So here's what she wrote child cleaned up in the quiet area once I made it a game for him to pick up the flannel story pieces. He picked up six story pieces on his own, apologized to teacher one for not using nice words with her as he gave her a hug and a kiss. Then he gave teacher two a bear hug as he transitioned to the next activity with the class. So just receiving uh, an email like this really just emphasizes on how beneficial this program is and, and how hard these teachers work because I, I mean it really was just one feedback session and after 30 days you can tell that she did a lot of work um, to get to this point. Definitely and it always makes our hearts happy when we hear you know positive feedback like that. Thank you. All right question number three. Please share the biggest challenge you had in regards to your role during the pandemic. And let's start with Rosario. Well, the biggest uh, challenge for me was um, learning about what ICMHC was. So I said, you know, as I said earlier, I've been a clinician since 2009. And so that is uh, quite a long time and coming into this Space and early childhood education is a new, uh, something new for me. And then thinking about, you know, um, equitable practices is also something that I am learning more. So I think that that was the hardest thing for me is just uh, learning more about mental health consultation and then equity together. Um, it, it, it's, it's been a, a journey. So I'm still in it. I think I'm going to be in it for a while. Um, but that was the, the biggest challenge for me. Definitely. Thank you. Grace? So for me, the biggest challenge uh, I would say was adjusting to my new role and the new program. Coming from a mental health, uh, mental health agency where everything is fast paced and we, the therapists, obtain high caseloads to coming to a new program and role where patients and slowing down is the key uh, on, on obtaining clients, mm -hmm. having feelings of uncertainty and thinking maybe I'm not doing enough. Well, uh, or when will I have clients? I remember having lots of supervisions with Rosario where our main discussion had to do with patients, patients with obtaining referrals. And when I did, it was talking about patients and being patients with the process. Thank you, Grace. Denise? 
Thank you, Marseille. So the biggest challenge for me was learning the role mm -hmm. um, and sticking to the role. Mm -hmm. um, I was a mental health clinician before becoming a mental health consultant. And so learning to take off that hat and putting on the consultant hat was really difficult. Um, so I had to really be present at all times and just try to separate the therapist from the consultant. Definitely. Thank you, ladies. All right, last question. Share strategies you utilize to overcome hesitation in signing up for bees from caregivers or early childhood educators. And we can start with you, Grace. Sure. Thank you, Marcia. The strategies I utilize to overcome hesitation from the uh, from the early childhood educators signing up for bees program, we're emphasizing the benefits and the support they will be obtaining with the bees, providing a clear explanation of the role of the mental health consultant and discussing ways the mental health consultant will teach and guide new techniques and skills and interventions to understand the child's behavior. Thank you. Rosario? So from a, a leadership perspective, um, you know, when we did the focus group and it gave us uh, tons of information and uh, we, we got the sense that childcare providers would be super on board with the program and would be accessing the program, we thought that we would get like so many uh, requests for services and we would be fully, uh, you know, uh, caseloads full and everything in a short amount of time. Well, the reality is that, you know, we haven't been. You know, that's, that's been, um, you know, something for me to think about. Um, and what comes up for me is I think that there's a lot of spots that we missed, you know, in terms of looking at the, in terms of equity, we only really targeted or we outreached those providers that had the technology to look at our flyer. And so um, I'm trying to take that back in and now that things seem to be opening up everywhere, uh, perhaps we can do more. Uh, footwork, you know, and visiting providers in person and, and doing more of that connection, which seems like based on the on the focus group information that they really gravitate towards. So that is something that I want to look at more. Uh, you know, it's important to look at what happened and the things that did not work and kind of to, to inform where we're going. And so that's what I would like to look at. Uh, that That's the strategy I would want to use. Thank you, Rosario. Denise? Thank you, Marche. I think that <clears throat> first, it's important to just be understanding um, about the ECE schedule and realize how extremely busy and under pressure they are. And when we meet with them, I think that pointing that out, um, just real, just just saying it in words to them. My goodness, I can tell you're very busy and you're overwhelmed. That has been super helpful for me um, because they feel understood. You know, mm -hmm. definitely, and that also helps in you know building that relationship. So thank you for that. All right, thank you so much, team, for just being vulnerable and sharing this. Um, brave space with all of us to learn more about what has taken place within our program while you know as Denise stated we are building this plane while flying it you know so all right now I'm going to hand it back over to you Rosario to conclude our session thank you Marche thank you ladies so um okay I'm going to skip over to here uh, I want to invite everybody to connect with us. So, I, I mean, I, again, I'm all for learning and taking feedback. So if you have feedback about the way I presented today, I want to hear that. If you have a, a, you know, a comment about any information, uh, I want to hear it. Or if you have ideas for how we can grow uh, the BEES program, um, I would love to hear it too. So here's our contact information uh, for you to continue, for us to continue the conversation offline. And I'm going to hand it over to Lauren, I believe. And so thank you so much for joining us. I, I have some feedback. Um, this was a fantastic, wonderful, wonderful session. Um, I cannot thank you all enough for, first of all, your incredible efficiency. You made it through all of that on the dot of time. So that alone is phenomenal. Um, I am so sorry we don't have time for, for Q&A because I know that this, uh, everyone here would really love to have time. Um, and unfortunately we just don't, but I, I hope everyone does connect with you all offline. Um, thank you for being vulnerable. Thank you for, for jumping into this, this brave Zoom space. I mean, you just, everything you talked about um, 
the energy and enthusiasm that you feel for your work was absolutely palpable. And um, I know I speak for everyone in the audience when I say thank you for, for sharing that energy with us today. Um, really, truly, don't, I don't have uh, adequate words other than thank you so, so much. Um, and we are going to close now so we can um, get to our final plenary of the session, which I do hope everyone's planning on attending. It's going to be a really spectacular. So thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.